employ people and an environment where you can When the war was on, Gilbert was 10 years old, 8 years old, and he used to talk about the planes flying overhead and watching them fight. He watched planes being shot down, men parachuting out of their out of their planes, and he fell in love with flying. He he just thought it was um, a truly wonderful thing. Like when he when the war was on, he was just a little boy, and it was all a big adventure. But he used to have dreams, and nightmares about the war. Um, the only way I would know he was having a dream is that he would start talking in Italian and thrashing about and so I would have to wake him to stop and he was then he would tell me what he was dreaming and it was always about the war and um, the bombing and the planes and he had nightmares for a long time but they eventually went away and he, he stopped having them. Gilbert was brought from Italy because it was so soon after the war. His mother and his auntie de thought that there wasn't anything for Gilbert there. So he came out here and finished his schooling and they legally adopted him so, because he wanted to join the Air Force. So he became Popovich and um, he went into the Air Force to a class of, I think there was 89 men in the class, and he graduated the top 12. And only, I think it was the top seven or nine became pilots, so he was a co-pilot, which didn't make him happy um, because he wanted to fly the plane, not to help chart where they were traveling to. So he, when he left the Air Force, he met up with a friend, ran into a friend actually, from Riva. And um, so he ended up in Beaver Cove, which is across the streets here, and became a logger. He worked one day without pay, and then he went in and asked for a job. and. Um, so he logged for, I think it was something like seven years, he was a logger. Came to Alert Bay three times before even knowing the name of our island. And he came here and when I first saw him, the first time I ever saw him, he was working for the village and he was digging ditches. And he said that's what qualified him to become mayor because he worked his way up from being an employee, part-time employee, digging ditches and became alderman for four years and then the mayor of Alert Bay for 28 years. It was probably around 19, I was looking last night, I think it was around 1968. 1968, 1969. I worked with them over in. Uh, was called. It's. It's still there, but it's was called Kokish, but the whole site is, is gone now. Used to be a big logging camp in there. I met him in the cookhouse. And uh, he was logging at the time and working on the road crew. And then he started coming over to Alert Bay. The next time I met him, I was probably. 1970 or something, he was driving cab here, but he told me when I first met him we used to sit right alongside each other at the morning and at night time, at supper time, and he told me one time that one day he'd be mayor in Alert Bay, and I told a bunch of other people that were from Alert Bay and we all had a big laugh about it, but I guess the laugh turned around the other way, the laugh was on us. To an extent, he did something as I did myself. He, got, he developed friends at Alert Bay, and little by little, he became part of the community there. 
where uh, when logging shut down, he would go to Alert Bay. When logging shut down, I went to the mine and worked in the mine. So we both had a, a history of wanting to work and wanting to be useful. Essentially, m most logging operations and mining operations along the coast of British Columbia, and in fact in much of the interior of British Columbia, tended to hire single men or men who might have had families someplace else, but they didn't accommodate families in these logging and mining operations because it was less troublesome for the companies to have just have men have a cookhouse, feed the men, they work, work hard through the season as long as the weather was good and keep the operation going. There were ducks and geese and eagles sitting on the beach here digging clams and you know it was it was a beautiful place to live as you know my first experience of of life in Canada essentially was right here with the woods behind us the ocean out in front and the pure air like the, the air is so fresh I just thought this is where I'm going to stay we went for a walk down onto the dock and then we walked down there and we sat on a rock on the beach. Big, big rock sticking out of the beach. And we're sitting on the rock. Our tummies are full. We've had a really good supper. And I said, we haven't started work yet. I said to my pal, you know, it was, it was a day like this. It was June 1956. Sun was shining, going down in the west. Fresh air, trees everywhere, no town. I said to my pal, a guy could settle down in a place like this. And he turned to me and he said, you're friggin' nuts. He, 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 he wasn't cut out for the same kind of ideas that I had. So years later, when the logging company was doing subdivisions, they did a subdivision. And I went and I saw them and I bought the lot next to that rock that we sat on. So it sits out in front of our house now. Gilbert used to come over from Beaver Cove on the weekends for to have little parties, you know what I mean? We had two or three beer parlors and uh, and lots of lady, lady friends. And being a handsome Italian, he, uh, he didn't have to take long to find himself girlfriends, you know what I mean? So anyway, um, he, uh, he f f I guess, fell in love with my wife's sister, Louisa. And they had five beautiful children over the, over the years. And then uh, eventually, like every marriage, it sort of uh, floundered and uh, they separated. And, uh, and uh, so uh, uh, he had the children. He, he had the children, and I believe it wasn't too long after that but that Louisa passed away. And so he, Gilbert brought his mother over from Italy to babysit, and she sat, babysat for three years. And in the meantime, when, when he came over and settled in Lord Bay, I hired him. I was on the village council, and I hired him as a laborer for public works. And that was his first job in Alert Bay. And then later on, uh, when I was in the taxi business, um, I, th I th figured he'd make a good cab driver, so I hired him to drive taxi. And between driving taxi for me and, and running a bus, uh, we had a big bus that used to pick passengers up and to drop them off, and, and uh, he, he would drive that bus as well. That was part of his job. You know, Gilbert, he, uh, he was a, a kind of an ambitious uh, sort of person, and uh, eventually uh, he'd become a taxi owner, owner driver. We, we had a 40K taxi, which had eight cabs for a small little town, eight taxis, and they were all owned individually by the owner. Like, I, I, I had three cabs at one time, but I sold two, two to the, the owners or drivers, and they become owners. So that was what he was doing. And then uh, him and I 
he used to always argue about how he, he, he bought my cab out from, from me. You know? <laughs> I told him he got a real good deal, and he, he said the opposite. <laughs> But anyway, uh, no, he's a, he was a good fella. Well, he wouldn't have been mayor if he wasn't a good man. You know, he was mayor for a lot of years. When his children were getting up in age, you know, 12, 13, 14, he took over a gas station here, a service marine station. And it's a service to airplanes and boats. And uh, he did that for a few years. He, he never liked to stay into one business too long. You know what I mean? So, uh, you know, he, uh, he, he would uh, maybe work at three or four to five years. Hmm? And then, uh, you know, the other thing he did, uh, which just about all of us did, was uh, fishing was always on your, on your menu. And uh, he, uh, he went fishing. I, I think it was with Freddie Jolliffe, was it not? And, uh, <clears throat> and so, of course, uh, he was fishing with Freddie Jolliffe, and I think uh, Margie was, uh, I think she was cooking on there, so uh, eventually um, he married her. And Gilbert fished with my Uncle Freddie for quite a few years on the Markley Sound. I don't know, he always seemed to have his fingers in something. He was always doing some kind of cab driving or fuel dock or something. He was always busy. Gilbert had the fuel dock here in Alert Bay, and he uh, it was the last fuel dock left in Alert Bay. There was three or four here at one time, and they all moved out. And Gilbert kept the one here for quite a few years, but when he first got the dock, it was up for bids or something, and no one else wanted to run it here in Alert Bay, so, or couldn't get the contract, whatever, but he, uh, he took it over, and uh, then when everybody found out that Gilbert took it over, then they wanted him to resign or whatever because it was uh, um, something to do, you couldn't be mayor and have the fuel dock at the same time. So he did, he resigned. And then they let the people vote on it again and they said, no, no, Gilbert can run a fuel dock and be mayor too. So <clears throat> he ran, him and his daughters ran that fuel dock for 10 years, I guess, the last 10 years. And it just comes so that once the fishing started to go downhill, well, he wasn't selling any fuel. And uh, it's too bad because now we got no fuel dock here. It took us a long time to get a fuel station. He had the fuel, the gas station, the last gas station in Alert Bay too. But uh, it was pretty funny when, when they wanted him to resign because he had the fuel dock, and, uh, and then when he did resign, everybody was sort of disappointed, so they got him back in as mayor again. swim or not. But no, he couldn't swim out here. Maybe <laughs> up in the, in the lakes, maybe you can because they warm up, but in here, in the actual ocean, it's just too cold. You don't stay in there for very long. I'm sure he right. could. It wouldn't help too much out here anyway. He wouldn't stay that long. So all these guys that are out there sanding and gillnetting and whatnot, if they go overboard, they've had it. And of course, I'm, I've had it anyway, even if they can swim. Yeah, I was born here, yeah. So I like it here, I really like it here, it's nice. But you gotta have a boat. He was a very good person. Yeah. Yeah, no, I didn't fish with him, but I, I fished when he fished, right? He didn't fish very long, though, but, yeah. And he had his own boat or whatever. He had a little speedboat or whatever. I think, 
Um, Terry still has it, his daughter. I moved away from Alert Bay when I was 16 years old, and I returned to Alert Bay at 29. My father owned a fish plant, and uh, I got a job with him. His partner didn't want me to work because he thought, oh no, Gilbert's daughter won't be able, she won't do the job. But it turned out really well, so I worked with him with his uh, processing plant and then soon after he took over the fuel dock he was the agent to run the dock here and he hired me and my sister Vanessa also to help him run it and um, not long after I took over a lot of the responsibilities and taught my dad how to use the computer because he, he did not did not know how to use it at all so that was lots of fun. Um, I worked with him for about 13 years at the fuel dock until he passed. He talked about his grandpa um, being a really strong socialist and the 1st of May walking through the village with this red umbrella and there was a group of men that used to do this every year. And as a punishment, I mean, they were too old to send to jail or... So as a punishment, they had to drink this um, um, cod liver oil or something that would make them sick for a couple of days. And, but, you know, they always did it. And he learned that from his grandpa, you know, to stand up to, to what you believe in, whether it's right or wrong, you know, to... Um, and he said his grandpa always did that. So it was his grandpa that made him think about politics. Um, because his grandpa was, he had a nick, his grandpa's nickname was the bumblebee. What is that word in Italy, in Italian? Moscom, that's what he, he used to call his grandpa because he um, would get so excited about his politics and um, carrying this red umbrella the 1st of May every year. And um, so it kind of, and Gilbert used to run around and when he would get into trouble with his grandpa, he would make up stories and say, oh, no, no, do you, you know, did you hear? And then, of course, his grandpa would get so carried away with Gilbert's story, he would forget to discipline Gilbert. So that's where he learned his politics from, his grandpa. <laughs> Alert Bay, we, uh, we used to call it Little Vancouver. Now, th that was because from Vancouver to Prince Rupert, which was the major steamship lines, we were the only stop between the two two places, and 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 uh, it was it was quite the quite the place, and uh, and uh, the, you know a lot of people really fell in love with it, and especially was was the uh, half the island being reserve, you know, native reserve, and with all the Indian totem poles and things like that it, it was very attractive to the to the uh, you know tourists or whoever you know alert bay is a little village that's been here for a very long time it's been here since the first point of white contact in the late 18 1800s and uh, it's the oldest municipality the oldest town in northern vancouver island we have a date of incorporation as a village of 1946, um, long before Port McNeil or Port Hardy or any of these other towns were here. Uh, this was the center of uh, trade and commerce and shipping, and uh, it was also the terminus of the telegraph, um, telegraph system, the Morse system of communication for the whole coast. So uh, it was also a, a naval, navy uh, station. Uh, so the HMS Alert is, the town is named after the HMS Alert, Her Majesty's Ship, the Alert, which is uh, the 
naval vessel that was stationed here uh, to protect the coastline. When Gilbert first came here, he found a community with this Chinese population and a lot of the nurses were Filipino, as I said, and the First Nation community and this community of fishermen. Uh, so very, a very multicultural situation he arrived to and he thrived very, he thrived on that um, melting, melding of those different populations working towards the same goals. So very much a man with no borders, if you will, no, uh, no boundaries to his, his appreciation and way of thinking of community. He used to talk about where he came from, uh, uh, Lake Garda, and uh, his his little village. And he showed me some pictures. And he used to go back there a few times. And in fact, once he went back, uh, he was interviewed on Italian television, and uh, they had uh, a story about Gilbert. And he came back and showed me a clip, newspaper clipping, in which in which they. Uh, called him Gilbert Popovich, the mayor of Canada and chief of all the Indians. Because Alert Bay uh, is, of course, half of the island that we live on is an Indian reservation. And uh, half of uh, the island is governed by, by native band, uh, which uh, <coughs> Gilbert was very good at, uh, at uh, talking to them when we were very friendly with them. And he was a good friend of the chief, uh, who is still the chief right now, Chief Bill Cranley. One of the things that uh, uh, that I guess he was trying to tell us is the effects uh, post post war, post Second World War, and how people were suffering a great deal and trying to. Uh, trying to uh, uh, you know bring themselves up after that uh, that awful time and uh, so you know the, the there was the, the war in Europe we're in that same kind of situation here it's continuing continuing and it'll continue until we uh, are successful in signing an agreement with Canada and British Columbia we were the only white man in our family. Yeah, right. I told you that, didn't I? <laughs> well, you know, that was the way it was in those days. Uh, if a, if a, <clears throat> if a, a native girl married a white man, she, she lost her status. And if a, a white man married a in, in the girl, she, she, how does that work? <laughs> I couldn't get mixed up here but uh, you know but now they, they've changed the law completely so Gilberto Gilbert uh, was my uncle uh, his uh, his uh, first wife uh, of, of my cousins is my mother's sister Louisa is his first wife's name and my mother is Martha uh, and 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 just to note uh, my my mother's my mother's mother, my grandmother's a Martin, um, and we stem from. I'm not sure if you heard uh, Spruce Martin, Mungo Martin. That is that is our family lineage, and it's very strong within our Nungis. But Gilbert, awesome, awesome man. I can't say enough about him. He was like a father. We grew up uh, two houses down from him and uh, his family, my cousins. Big heart, very passionate about what he did in living life and very compassionate and empathetic uh, toward uh, not just uh, you know First Nations and understanding him having a good understanding of what happened there uh, but to, to anybody and everybody just very welcoming uh, you know great spirit and uh, dedicated to uh, um, to his people as a whole you know it wasn't just uh, being mayor of uh, the 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 uh, township of Alert Bay, uh, but more of all people on Cormorant Island, he's very instrumental in bringing our two uh, um, 
bringing the whole community together. And, and again, coming from a, a big heart and um, doing it in a very gentle way. Yeah.